Hello friends, I'm Conrad and welcome to Bad Guy Breakdowns, the series where we look at the most iconic villains to grace the silver screen. On the 12th of May 2009, author Neil Gaiman responded to an email asking him whether fans of the long-running A Song of Ice and Fire series were justified in feeling frustrated that author George R. R. Martin had yet to finish the story he began in 1996. Neil was... polite. But ultimately, his response can be summed up in one sentence. George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. His sentiment that authors do not work for readers is one I think a lot of people agree with in principle. You buy a book, you consume it, and if it's part of a series you look forward to the next one coming out. There's no contract between you and the author binding them to your future business. But what happens when you internalise your enjoyment of something out of your control and make it part of your own identity? Could constructing these solipsistic notions of character and story, potentially ones that differ from the ideas the creator holds, actually be dangerous? In the 1990 film adaptation of Misery, director Rob Reiner and scriptwriter William Goldman preemptively answer that last question with a profound, uh, yes, actually. In it, the author of a successful series of books suffers an accident and is abducted by an obsessed fan, a manic nurse with an enormous mean streak and a shady past. And. If that sounds like it has the makings of a fairly cheap, straight-to-TV thriller, then you're about right, to be honest. But Misery is elevated from being forgettable by the performances of its two leads, James Kahn as the author and the relatively unknown Kathy Bates as the villain. Reiner knew he needed a star opposite Kahn to make this work. Someone who could capture the physicality of his villain, but who also had the range to dote on trapped author Paul Sheldon like a superfan would. And in Bates, they absolutely found one. Her performance as Annie Wilkes is... a real blockbuster. You might even call it... a bone breaker. What I'm saying is that she will break your ankles. Literally. With a sledgehammer. Listen, whatever. Let's get into the villainy. Annie Wilkes grew up in Bakersfield, California, where she had a pretty tumultuous early life. Suffering from extreme mental instability, including bipolar disorder culminating in her murdering her own father, her neighbours, their father, and a little later, a random hitchhiker. So, she was off to a bad start. No shit, twisted, fuck. Presumably attempting to turn her life around, she attended nursing school, a career path which ultimately led her to a position as head maternity nurse at a hospital in Boulder, Colorado, the same city Jack Torrance lived in, though it's unclear whether they crossed paths. I could really write my own ticket if I went back to Boulder now, couldn't I? Maybe she helped deliver Danny. Okay, maybe not. After being involved in the deaths of numerous infants at the ward, which is really the one thing you're not supposed to do as a maternity nurse, she was taken to trial, but ultimately acquitted due to a lack of evidence, though that didn't stop the press dubbing her the Dragon Lady. Sometime around this trial, her marriage to a physical therapist fell apart, and he ended up leaving her, although, surprisingly, didn't meet a sticky end. In total, at the time of meeting Paul Sheldon, Annie has already killed about 70 people, which honestly sounds exhausting. But perhaps not quite as exhausting as dedicating oneself so absolutely to one series of books as Annie does with Sheldon's Misery series, which, based on her and the author's ages, she has been reading since her early 20s. 
she struggles to distinguish between the world of Misery Chastain and reality, suffers from bouts of extreme depression and mood swings that see her become easily angry or violent. Her goal in rescuing Sheldon from a car wreck and nursing him back to health is to coerce him into resurrecting the character of Misery, who he had killed off in his last book in an attempt to move on to new material. A religious woman, in theory at least, Wilkes believes that God speaks to her and sees Sheldon crossing her path as a form of divine intervention, a chance to save him from making a mistake and leaving Misery behind. Above all else, she believes she knows what's best for Misery. And that sense of possession over something she didn't create is the thing I find most fascinating about her, because it reminds me so profoundly of a lot of modern fans of movie series or books. So fascinating in fact that I wrote two and a half thousand words on my problems with these fandoms, tangentially tying it back to Annie just often enough to make it seem like I was still talking about misery. It was succinct, interesting, and most of all, would probably have changed a lot of people's minds. Just kidding, I read it back and hated myself for it. Maybe I'll release it as a separate video entitled Grown Man Reveals Deep-Seated Misanthropy Because of Spider-Man. But with all that said, there's still a conversation to be had about what makes Annie's particular brand of fanatic consumption so compelling. Now, there's an elephant in the room here, and I know that because I just opened the door and gently ushered it in and it's sort of standing with its trunk halfway through the doorway, unsure of what it's supposed to be doing now because, you know, it's an elephant and it doesn't understand YouTube. So I'm going to reiterate what I just said. There's something that struck me as I rewatched Misery recently. Annie Wilkes's penchant for wildly swinging between overblown adoration and violent anger reminds me an awful lot of how the internet reacts to superhero and Star Wars movies and I think that's a massive part of what makes her interesting to me. Now, to be clear, I don't think this was Stephen King's intent when he wrote the character. I mean, how could it have been? Fandom has changed so much in the last 40 years. From his point of view, she was a metaphor for the relationship between author and work, between financial success and creative freedom, and perhaps most explicitly between King himself and drugs. In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine in 2014, the author said, Annie was coke, Annie was booze, and I decided I was tired of being Annie's pet writer. But if you look at the most memorable characters in movies, they usually find new ways to be relevant as they age, and Annie Wilkes is no exception. In 1987, when King wrote the novel, she was the Mark David Chapman figure the lone crazy who could snap and kill a John Lennon for seemingly nothing, a very personal demon for a writer who already had plenty. But in 2022, her brand of crazy has been commodified and turned into an industry. Movie studios attempt to directly appeal to people like Wilkes now because they will unquestioningly consume what they are provided with, and will utterly dominate film discussion spaces. If it were written today, she would have a YouTube channel where she talks exclusively about Star Wars, probably including a hyperbolic rant about Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. She doesn't remind me of all fans of these kind of movies, I want to make that clear. But there's definitely a similarity between Wilkes considering Misery novels high art while talking dismissively about the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and modern movie fandom subcultures choosing to only discuss the very safe, very predictable movies they consume. In both cases, the art that speaks to them is all that matters. If Annie got her way, there wouldn't be many other movies, and it's hard to look at how homogenised popular movies are becoming without seeing the same kinds of ideologies at work. 
But are these fans exclusively to blame for their own blinkered form of consumption? For falling victim to an industry designed to present them only with media that is easy to sell and consume? Yes! The only right an Annie Wilkes has in a creative endeavour is deciding whether to buy it or not. Her attachments to the characters, to the world Sheldon created, none of them actually mean anything. But while the dynamic between Sheldon and Wilkes is undoubtedly the artist-consumer relationship taken to its most extreme conclusion, Wilkes's obsession with misery has obscured how she views herself in it. She's created a third step, we'll call it collaborator, where she has consumed so much that she actually has valuable expertise which can be used by the artist to create his work. Now, obviously, this is nonsense. The opinions of fans on how a work of art should be improved should always be kept at arm's length. There might be some valuable stuff in there, but the vast majority of it will be absolute garbage. Anyway, in Misery, Annie's collaboration is obvious and rarely valuable. Sheldon still had a good Misery book in him before he knew she existed. He was just leaving it on the table to go and work on other things, despite Annie labouring under the delusion that she played a crucial part in dragging it out of him. Which is A. Untrue, and B. Absolutely how fans like Annie would see their role in this situation. I never meant for it to become my life. And if I hadn't gotten rid of it now, I'd have ended up writing it forever. Fortunately, Sheldon doesn't deliver the book Annie is demanding. The only thing more dangerous than allowing your fans to think they are playing a part in the creative process is actually doing it. Crowdsourcing your story is a Faustian bargain you can never really come back from, because once you establish that your fans have valuable creative input, you make the work of art partially theirs, which is only going to make their sense of ownership worse and the whole cycle repeats again. And this is where Annie and modern fandoms diverge, where her input is violently rejected by Sheldon. <laughs> Many modern media properties seem willing to make movies explicitly to cater to the demands of the audience at the expense of an artist's creative vision. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is probably the best example of this, where large chunks of their movies aren't even made by the director, specifically action sequences shot to a formula by external production houses. And these are normally competently made, I'm not here to criticise their quality. But in removing the directorial input, the message is clear. This is what our fans like, so we're going to keep doing this. It kind of elevates the demands of the consumer to the same level as the director. Now, movie studios have always catered to consumer demands to some extent, and art has always been created in the middle ground between expression and financial success. Renaissance artists like Michelangelo were allowed to take five years painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel because they had wealthy benefactors paying them to do so. But when you allow your benefactors to determine the nature of your expression, as well as the scale, because the financial success they offer is so significant, art dies. I suppose what I'm trying to say is, when King wrote Misery, his idea of a dark ending was having Paul Sheldon escape from his ordeal carrying physical and mental scars that would haunt him for the rest of his life. His ability to create art is potentially forever compromised by his experience. But, in comparing the dynamic he depicted between creator and consumer to its modern equivalent, we may have kind of ended up at an even darker one, where not only did Paul not escape from the clutches of Annie Wilkes, but he found her creative desires so lucrative that he willingly stayed and gave up on his own artistic independence. To misery. To misery. Okay, we've got me projecting my anxieties about the modern climate of movie production and consumption onto a 30 year old character out of our systems. I've been sitting here suffering. So well done you for sitting through that. 
As a reward, we're now going to talk about Kathy Bates breaking ankles for a bit. Do that Nick cut. Oh! Shit! Ah! And it is only fitting that we end with the most obvious reason that Annie Wilkes has remained such a famous villain, and that's in the performance of Bates. It's not enough to just say that Bates was memorable. She was, but why did her performance work so well? And I think the answer to that lies in who she is as a person. You only need to watch a few minutes of interview footage from the press junket of Misery back in 1990 to get a sense of how nice she seems. Like the most innocent person in the world who wouldn't hurt a fly. I mean, for fuck's sake, she brought a little dog to this interview. Look at it! Look at it! Now, I'm always a little wary of drawing sweeping conclusions about people I don't know based on their public-facing personas, but Kathy Bates, by all accounts, is a pretty cool person. And I just gotta tell you, never share a joint with a stranger, even if they're famous. Especially Bill Maher. The unassuming, gentle aura she exudes translates into her performance as Annie in a fascinating way. It's a testament to how good an actress she is, that she is able to harness her own personality and then layer the threatening nature of Wilkes believably on top of it, saying nothing of the physicality required to repeatedly overpower Sheldon, including their final confrontation. But it's not just the villainous air that makes Wilkes so good, there's even a hint of comedy in there too. Oh, this whole house is gonna be filled with romance! <gasps> I'm gonna put on my Liberace records! The dynamic that Bates and Khan struck is the foundation on which the whole of Misery sits. Without their chemistry, this movie would feel like a cheap, straight-to-TV thriller. And it's a wonder that they achieved the performances they did given their relationship with one another. To put it bluntly, Bates and Khan didn't really enjoy working together. In an interview with Yahoo in 2019, Rob Reiner stated that James Kahn was a very instinctive actor who didn't like to rehearse, while Bates was stage trained and preferred to go over material ahead of time. And this led to clashes between the stars. It really frustrated me because Jimmy doesn't like to rehearse and I'm from the theatre and I love lots of rehearsal. So I think we were butting heads from the very beginning. In fact, much of his job as director was attempting to balance their desires and act as a peacemaker between them. Bates herself admitted that she found Khan very frustrating to work with. I just got so frustrated working with him. And credits Reiner's direction for allowing her to channel that frustration back into her performance. And you can kind of feel that friction in the scenes where Annie and Paul butt heads. What better way to passive-aggressively suggest that you don't enjoy working with your co-star than by doing it through the character you're playing? Anything else I can get while I'm in town? Any other crucial requirements that need satisfying? Bates also revealed that she had a crush on one of the camera operators during filming, and because of how tight the camera usually was on her face, she would often end up looking into this cameraman's eyes as she delivered lines, rather than a Khan, who she frequently couldn't even see. So, when Wilkes goes all doe-eyed and swoons over Paul... Oh, Paul. It would be an honour. That's actually Kathy Bates swooning over the camera guy. But I'm really ignoring the obvious here. Weaving legitimate frustration into your lines and flashing the eyes at a cameraman you have the hots for is one thing. But getting into incredibly violent stage fights without killing James Khan? Now that takes some real chops. He isn't the biggest man in the world. He's a little over 5 foot 7 now at the age of 81, so he was probably 5'8 or 5'9 at the time of filming. But Kathy Bates is only 5 foot 2, and you would absolutely never know that she was smaller than him from Misery, where she is presented as his physical equal or even superior. Part of that is down to Rob Reiner and cinematographer Barry Sonnenfeld choosing to shoot up at her a lot of the time. It gives her character an imposing presence in the frame that suggests power. But just as important as that is the physical performance of Bates herself. And when I say physical, I don't mean that she moved around a lot, I mean that she actually had to perform some feats of impressive strength. It's unclear whether it's Bates lifting Khan out of his car wreck at the beginning of the movie because we never see her face, but I can't find anything saying it isn't, so I'm going to assume that it was. 
and there's no doubt about it being Bates hoisting her co-star into bed repeatedly, or carrying him down a set of stairs on her back to hide him from the sheriff, she displays a seriously impressive commitment to the physicality of the role. And, of course, there are two scenes in Misery which exploit all of the work done to establish Wilkes as a physical force. I'm gonna say right now that there's gonna be some explicit stuff coming up, so you've been warned. Obviously, we can't talk about Misery or Bates' performance in it without talking about the hobbling scene. It's the point of no return, the moment where Paul's plans to escape are exposed and his returning physical strength is robbed from him once more. And more than that, it's one of the most enduring scenes in the history of horror cinema, but several members of the cast and crew weren't actually happy with it. Whatever you think I'm not doing, Please don't do it. Prior to beginning shooting, they had planned to replicate the scene as it was in the novel, where Wilkes chops off Paul's left foot with an axe and then cauterizes the wound. William Goldman had even written it this way in the original screenplay. But reportedly the project lost original director George Roy Hill because of this scene, although I can't find a source for this anywhere potential stars like Warren Beatty and Bette Midler passed on the project because of the shocking violence. And even after Rob Reiner, who also produced the movie, stepped in to direct, the feeling around the crew regarding the scene was one of uncertainty. Reiner initially wanted to keep the scene as Goldman had written it, but after asking for opinions around the set and considering feedback from Warren Beatty, it was decided that Paul losing a foot would rob his emergence from this ordeal of the victorious feeling they wanted to achieve and so it was changed to the hobbling that we would eventually see, where Wilkes breaks both of Paul's ankles with a sledgehammer and a 2 by 4 God's sake! It's for the best. Hey, please! Ah! Almost done. Goldman was furious at the time, though would later admit that the change was an improvement as it made Annie's madness more sympathetic than if she had cut off Paul's foot. I don't know if I agree with the writer there, as this violence is still pretty horrific, but it's good that he made his peace with it. And Kathy Bates herself really struggled to shoot the scene, with James Kahn recalling that due to her strong anti-violent stance, which again, just ah, makes her seem like she's probably pretty cool, right? But shooting this through those beliefs was a real challenge for her, and she would spend a lot of time crying on set around the time of filming it. But despite the changes, the trepidation on set, and Bates' difficulties with getting through filming it, what we ended up with was an iconic moment in horror. The finale of Misery, while undoubtedly less memorable than the hobbling scene, is worthy of mention in its own right not least because Khan and Bates performed it entirely themselves without stunt assistance. With lovable Sheriff Buster sporting two additional holes in his chest thanks to Annie and her shotgun, Mr. Sheldon? the pace of the final ten minutes of misery ratchets up considerably, culminating in a clash between the two leads when it's revealed that Sheldon isn't actually interested in a suicide pact with his captor before burning the newly finished Misery manuscript in front of her. The single most noteworthy aspect of that confrontation is James Kahn doing that thing where you light a match with your thumbnail. Seriously, how do you do that? Let me know in the comments. But just beneath that is the physicality both of them bring to the scene. That's just Kathy Bates trying to put out a fire on her own arm, then getting speared to the floor by Kahn, then having burnt paper shoved in her mouth. The one moment that isn't her is a brief shot of a model when Sheldon trips her with his legs and she falls headfirst onto the typewriter. <laughs> but other than that, all baits, baby. <laughs> and beyond the impressive stage fighting, it's the facial expressions that really get me about this scene. The raw, unvarnished hatred and spite which is visible in almost every shot, 
leaving us with images of her face burned into our minds. And if the conclusion of the film is anything to go by, burned into Paul's too. Much like her effect on Paul, Annie stays with us after the screen fades to black and Liberace's cover of I'll Be Seeing You croons over the final credits. Her impact on how he views himself, his work and his fans can never be diminished, because as the song says, he sees her in all the old familiar places. In all the old familiar places that this heart of mine And for Annie, she'd probably view this as a victory of sorts. She knew she was dying at the end of this ordeal one way or another, but now she'll live on forever, immortalised through violence and trauma. Thank you for joining us on Bad Guy Breakdowns. If you enjoyed this, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing as it really helps, and be sure to join us next time. We're heading to ancient Rome to spend some time with the son of an emperor in Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Until then, I've been Conrad, and I'll see you next time.